Hello, and welcome to Obscure and Forgotten PS1 Games Volume 4, the fourth installment in the ongoing series dedicated to shining a spotlight on some of the PlayStation's lesser known titles. It's been a few months since the last volume, but the wheel never sleeps, it's just been patiently spinning away waiting to dish out some more PS1 gaming goodness. If you're a returning viewer, you're likely already familiar with the format, but if it's your first time tuning in, allow me to quickly get you up to speed. Using a YouTube channel called the Virtual Gaming Library, I aim to watch 10 seconds of gameplay from every single PS1 game. Anytime a game piqued my interest and wasn't relatively well known, I put it down on a list. Now do keep in mind this list only includes Western releases. If you're looking for Japanese PS1 games, well, we've got a separate video series for that too if you like. So now we've got a giant list of obscure and forgotten PS1 games, but how do we decide which games to play? Well, we're going to leave that up to chance. First we add each of the games into a list randomizer. Once the list has been randomized, we then select the top 100 games and add them to a big spinning prize wheel. We're then going to spin the wheel 3 times, and whatever 3 games the wheel lands on, those are the games I'll be looking at in today's episode. But first, before we get started, VGL has bumped up the size of their PS1 catalog even further, now adding games from the letters M to O. So now the ridiculously sized list of games is even bigger and it was absolutely worth sitting through 15 minutes of Madden games to get. Well, let's not waste any more time. It's been too long since we dipped our toes into the ocean of obscure PS1 jank, but the time is now, and as always, the wheel will provide. <laughs> will provide. Volume 4's first game is KKND Crossfire, developed by Aussie Team Beam Studios and released exclusively in PAL regions in 1998, although the UK and Ireland got it a little bit later in early 1999. KKND stands for Crush, Kill and Destroy and was originally a series of RTS games released on computers between 1997 and 1998. I never played any of them personally but the series seems to be considered somewhat of a hidden gem, at least in terms of 90s PC RTS games. The series takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth where a nuclear war has ravaged the planet and the remaining survivors on Earth are split into three distinct factions, each vying for control of the planet's limited resources. Think of it kind of like a more futuristic Mad Max combined with classic Command & Conquer. Now of course this is a series about PS1 games and like many popular PC RTS games of the era, this one somehow found its way over to the PS1. And if it flew under the radar on PC, well you can bet that's doubly true for the PlayStation version. Also, to make things a little bit more confusing, KKND Crossfire isn't a port of the original KKND, it's actually a port of KKND 2 Crossfire. I imagine they dropped the 2 since the original never came out in the PS1, but sure look, that never stopped Final Fantasy, and they did alright. But also, to add to the confusion, this isn't really a direct port of the PC game either. Think of KKND on the PS1 as sort of a stripped down version of the PC game with a few changes. Impressively, the developers managed to include all three factions as well as 15 individual missions for each, all on the one disc. But of course, to fit all of this on the disc, some cuts had to be made. In-game missions feature entirely redesigned maps that are much smaller than their PC counterparts. Plus, each of the three factions have had certain units removed too, reducing the overall size and variety of the factions in this version. Even with these cutdowns though, this still remains a surprisingly full fat RTS game, especially by console standards. Let's take a look at the game's three different factions, starting with your basic human faction called the Survivors, the only humans left on the planet and of course they're as hungry for violence as ever. There's also the Evolved who are the results of being exposed to a little too much nuclear radiation and living to tell the tale. 
These guys make up your monster tribal style faction. And lastly, the Series 9, who are farming robots who became sentient after humanity nuked the planet and destroyed all Earth's fertile ground. Now they hunt every living thing thanks to humans getting rid of their one and only sole reason for existing. Farming. As you can tell, this is the best faction. Now as mentioned, while the game does include unique missions for each, with the Evolve campaign being considered easy, Survivor normal and Series 9 hard, I did find each of the factions pretty samey to play. Sure they all have their own individual units, but the majority really serve the same basic function, as well as each faction having more or less the exact same overall playstyle. I don't know if this is down to the units being removed for the PS1 version, but honestly most of the time it can feel like you're making a choice between the colours red, blue or yellow. What does set the factions apart though, are the briefings prior to each campaign mission, a genre staple. These can be pretty funny and definitely add a bit of personality to each faction. I wouldn't say they really add to the story much, but they're always a welcome sight upon starting each mission. We've got the usual odds. A small party of our creatures against a larger enemy party. But our creatures are fast, and the enemy are drooling idiots. Repair a rundown camp you'll find in a canyon. Use all you have to lure the enemy into an ambush. Kill him too. Now the game does play like your traditional RTS from the era, including base building, resource management and a whole host of features that allow you to group and micromanage your units. Although the vast majority of campaign missions will limit you in regards to base building, with most featuring no base building at all, instead opting to provide you with a small number of set units to complete your objectives. There is some nice variety here which does get you up to speed with the various units individual strengths and weaknesses, but 99% of the time each mission really just boils down to wiping out every enemy on the map. Now if base building is more your thing, there is a skirmish mode called Chaos Mode which allows you to play in matches with up to 3 factions at the same time across 10 different maps. And it is in this mode that one of the game's single greatest features lies, split screen multiplayer in an RTS game. Now Herzog's Y on the Mega Drive did this first, but being able to play a proper PC style RTS with a friend on your telly in co-op or versus battles, that's pretty damn cool. So look, I think even with the cutbacks, we've got the bones of a pretty substantial RTS here on the PlayStation, but uh, we've got one big problem though. It's an RTS on the PlayStation. Which means by today's standards, this game's controls render the game almost unplayable. Now I'll be honest, I've always been a person to throw console RTS games a bone. My first experience with RTS games was on the PlayStation. Whether it was classics like Command & Conquer, Warcraft or Z, my introduction to the genre as a whole was in this format. Hell, I was still playing RTS games on console by the mid 2000s. Battle for Middle Earth 2 and Command & Conquer 3, I only played these games on the Xbox 360. And this was because my family didn't even have a home computer at this point. Of course, many years later, and with much more experience of the RTS genre on PC, well, I've seen the light. Mouse and keyboard is by far the best way to experience these games. Now once again, I'm not against RTS games on console. On the contrary, I think control schemes implemented in RTS games from the 360 era onwards actually play really well. Will you be as good compared to a keyboard and mouse user? No, absolutely not. But using a controller isn't as limiting as you might think, especially nowadays. On the PS1, however, you are very, very limited using a controller. We are bang in the middle of the experimentation stage of console RTS games, and while in the 90s people like me would take any RTS game possible due to the cost of owning a computer versus a PS1, nowadays this is just so difficult to go back and play. Now in fairness, KKND does allow you to perform pretty much any task you need to using the controller, but the whole thing feels so cumbersome and unwieldy. Trying to perform even the most straightforward micro or macro can be so, so difficult. There are shortcuts to view certain units and buildings, but scanning across the map and just having easy access to your units and your general surroundings, well, what's here, it's just not good enough. So for many, the controls will cause this game to be a write-off almost immediately. But this problem is compounded by the fact that this game is also incredibly difficult. Remember earlier when I said the game's campaigns are broken down into easy, normal and hard? Well, scratch that, all three are hard. Very hard. The game does have a general difficulty option too, but even on easy, I found most of these missions nearly impossible to complete without severe trial and error and almost complete map knowledge. It's almost like the AI difficulty hasn't been tuned to the fact that it's a console game. You're competing with difficult PC level AI and you're stuck struggling to control multiple units at a time. Throwing the fact that the units in this game have atrocious pathfinding, often needing to be babysat just to make sure they're not getting stuck on level geometry and well, let's just say you're facing quite the uphill battle. 
The maps themselves look okay. It's a post-apocalyptic wasteland after all, so the locations can look pretty grim and desolate with not very much variety overall. I do think they look fine for the time though. The buildings also look pretty nice, but the units are very small and can be very difficult to make out from one another at times, which kind of adds to the factions feeling very similar to play. I have to give props to the music though, as every faction has its own background themes and they match their individual styles very well, and some of these are also really, really good. Look, the bottom line here is that we have a PS1 RTS game, and unless you are really nostalgic for PS1 RTS games and you know what you're getting into, this isn't something I can really recommend for anybody else. I think the core of a good game is here, and look, we have to give mega props for adding split-screen multiplayer. But thanks to the brutal difficulty and unwieldy control scheme, it just makes this a very, very frustrating time, at least for me. But on the flip side, there's a whole PC version with more content and decent controls, so if you like classic RTS games, well then I think this might be one worth checking out if you're curious. As for the PS1 version, well, I'd still recommend going with any of the Command & Conquer games over this one. Sure, that is also hard to go back to, but it just has much better balance for console play, so at least you can ease yourself into it. Either way, at the very least, KKND had some great music and we got to chat with some Australian mutant people, so I'm happy I got to check it out all the same. We will provide. Next up we have Attack of the Saucer Man, which was released in the year 1999 and would you believe it, it's another PAL exclusive. This game was developed by the team at Foob Industries. I don't blame you if you've never heard of them before, this seems to be the only game they ever made. Although interestingly this game was published by Psygnosis and was the last game they published as a third party before being purchased by Sony entirely and becoming Studio Liverpool. So if the name didn't give it away, this is a game about aliens. Attack of the Saucer Man is an action platformer, although I'd say it's mostly a third person shooter that also has lots of jumping, exploration, puzzle solving and collect-a-thon elements. In this game you play as Ed the Alien and alongside your compadre Zunk you're both tasked with preventing a race of money hungry aliens known as Nedco from setting up a Ned farm on planet Earth which could end up disrupting the whole balance of power across the galaxy. So in other words humans are kind of caught up in the middle of some galactic politics and as a result Earth is getting invaded by two different alien races at the same time. Now Ed and Zunk are the good guys in this game, as members of the Grim Lloyd Galactic Empire you are technically trying to help Earth out here. But really your main goal is to stop the other aliens, which means humans are more of a nuisance than anything and you will treat them as such. There's a surprising amount of story sequences in this game. It mostly comes off as a lighthearted comedy sci-fi adventure for kids, but the dialogue between Ed and Zung can be pretty funny and the villains are suitably villainy, so I enjoyed it for what it was. Also, the dialogue isn't voice, but every character makes funny noises when they talk, which you may or may not get sick of after a few minutes, but I thought they were pretty fun. 
As for the game itself, well, the first thing that caught my eye when playing this was the graphics. Attack of the Saucer Man goes for a blend of 2D and 3D, with the majority of the character sprites and items appearing in 2D, and the environments and bigger elements appearing in 3D. It's an interesting look to say the least, certainly not the first game to try this, but it still looks kind of weird moving around as a sprite in a 3D world. I actually like the character designs quite a bit, there's some good personality on display here, even if the resolution of these guys isn't the best. I do appreciate that they tried something a little different at the very least. Also, the humans being zapped into pile of bones is always fun to see. As for the 3D, well, the environments look fine, I guess. I'd be lying if I said the 3D stuff here was very good. There's lots of warping and other technical issues as expected, but honestly, it does the job just fine. The levels are fine, the bigger 3D enemy models are fine. I didn't really notice anything especially bad. It's just all kind of meh. At least there's plenty of different levels in this game, and the environments do change often, so variety isn't really too much of an issue. Although I must say, this game is a fiend for the L draw distance. The game more or less gives you a small vision cone in front of the character, and everything outside of that limited vision cone is fog. For the outdoor levels, of which this game has many, it's a given I feel, but even the smaller indoor levels, this game is Fog City. Now look, if this is what the devs had to do to get the game running smoothly, that's fair enough, but this is some of the most extreme fog I've ever seen in a PS1 game, and it can be hard not to notice at times. As for the gameplay, well, as mentioned, this is an action platformer, although it controls very much like a PS1 era third person shooter, you know, pre-analog controls. You move forward and back using the D-pad, you turn left and right using the D-pad, you can strafe left and right using the L1 and R1 buttons. Honestly, this is probably the best third-person control scheme we had at the time, so I'm not complaining. The game starts out straightforward enough with you crash landing in Area 51, which works as a nice little opening section to get you used to the game. You have a blaster which slowly regenerates ammo, although you can still pick up ammo to speed up that process a little. The blaster also features a variety of different shot types which you can collect throughout the game, which all pull from the same ammo pool and turn your blaster into weapons like a shotgun or a... bouncy blaster? You also have this orb that follows you around which serves two functions. One is to fire at your sub-weapons from a variety of different explosives to defensive items like shields, and the other is to collect these little creatures called Neds who you will find around each level. Neds seem like dumb, tiny aliens that the bad aliens are using to ruin the earth somehow. I'm still not quite sure what they are, but they're cute and make lots of dumb noises, so I kind of love them. Anyway, there's a bunch of these in each level, and you can rescue them by shooting them, which traps them in a bubble, and then the orb will automatically collect these bubbles if you're close enough by. Some levels do require you to collect a certain number of these aliens, and others will not, but they tend to drop lots of health and ammo pickups, so there's pretty much no reason not to try and get as many of these little fellas as you can, regardless of the level's requirements. It didn't take long into the first level before I noticed shooting in this game is kind of weird. You can't really aim in this game, there's no reticles so your shots just come out right in front of you, but the game also kind of has an auto aim which points your shots towards nearby enemies. Although I found it was pretty inconsistent and it kind of just did whatever it felt like most of the time. It's definitely manageable, although in sections with multiple enemies it can be quite a bother. A good example of this is when I could shoot an explosive barrel next to a bunch of enemies, but the shots just kept going towards the enemies instead of the barrel and unfortunately I have no control over this. Also, while some enemies do have visible projectiles, a lot of the human enemies in this game have hit scan style weapons where it's hard to know what you're trying to dodge. All you see is the muzzle flash and you kinda just have to hope your strafing is good enough to not get you hit by whatever is coming out of their guns. The levels in Area 51 get you used to pretty much everything this game has to offer. You gotta explore every area, search for items or switches that let you progress forward, and then do a whole bunch of shooting and platforming in between. Once you're out of Area 51 though, the game's levels really begin to open up in scale, with much larger maps and a wacky time travel twist that seems you're going through various locations throughout Earth's history, from Victoria era London to exploring Aztec temples. Although while I found the early levels were generally fine, the larger levels became a bit of a chore to get around and this is down to two things, the controls and the difficulty. Now while I said the control scheme earlier was fine for this kind of game, which it absolutely is, the game unfortunately just feels so sluggish to play. All of Ed's movements feel so slow and unresponsive, and while this isn't too big an issue in smaller levels with a limited number of enemies, the larger open levels that feature tons of deadly enemies, most of which can move and turn faster than you, well yeah, it becomes a bit of a problem then. It's not like the game isn't heavy on extra lives and health pickups, but the combat can just feel like a war of attrition, like you're too slow to avoid taking damage most of the time. 
combat just never felt satisfying. It just felt like it was in the way more than anything. And as the levels become far bigger and more complex, the enemies get more plentiful and the platforming becomes more precise and punishing. Well, I found I was enjoying this game less and less the further I got into it. And if I'm being completely honest, there was nothing in particular that really wowed me about it in the first place. Playing through the early levels, collecting all the Neds, shooting soldiers and exploring all these locations, it was just all very... meh. And while I do appreciate the bigger scale of the later levels and the new environments, the game had already pretty much run out of steam for me, and this was prior to the difficulty and control issues making things worse. Oddly enough, one of the game's bonus levels had the exact opposite problem to the main game, where the controls for this were way, way too sensitive, and it was almost impossible to move in a straight line. Looks pretty funny though. Now even though I wasn't really digging this game, I do still like to play as far as I can into a game just in case something changes my mind, or maybe I need time to get accustomed to certain aspects. You know, sometimes things just take time and patience to really come across. Although, my time playing this game came to an unexpected stop during a certain level. Here you need to find a key to access a boss fight, which upon completion allows you to exit the level. Now I explored this level completely, found the key, and when I eventually got to the door, the key disappeared from my inventory and the door stayed locked. Now I didn't notice this immediately, so I kept searching around the level for another 10 or 20 minutes, which is way longer than I should have, but I thought I was being dumb and just missed something obvious. But nope, after watching a let's play and rewatching my own footage, the game just messed up on my end and well, that's me stuck. And of course, I had not saved the game and would have had to go back and play through the first two hours again, so there you go, that's me done. Although I watched some of the next five hours of gameplay from that point and yeah, bigger levels, more enemies, more fog, it's, it's all more of the same. So yeah, I'm okay, thanks. Look, I think it's safe to say this wasn't one of my favourite games on the series so far, but even though I didn't vibe with the gameplay, I still like the characters and the premise, plus I have a soft spot for that low res 2D style used for the characters. There's definitely some charm here. Also, I haven't mentioned it yet, but the music in this game is fantastic. B-movie alien sound effects mixed in with catchy and whimsical compositions, and it's all incredibly high quality. Even if you aren't a fan of the gameplay, I think the soundtrack is definitely worth a listen. Attack of the Saucer Man is a very one note experience. There's a lot of it, and if you like what that is, well then there's plenty here to keep you busy. Although unfortunately for me, I never really found the gameplay stuck out as anything more than an average action platformer at best, and a sluggish frustrating game at worst. It's hardly the worst action platformer on the PS1 by any means, but unless you really really like Aliens, there's not much to make it stand out as anything more than a weird little obscurity in the PlayStation's massive library. <laughs> will provide. Four's last game is Bloodlines, released for the PlayStation in 1999 once again as a PAL exclusive. All hail our 50 Hertz overlords. Interestingly, Bloodlines was developed by a Canadian studio called Radical Entertainment, so it's odd that it never came out in North America. 
Although while Radical mostly have a history with licensed video games, this is the same studio behind the much loved Jackie Chan Stuntmaster and the even more loved Simpsons Hit and Run, so maybe we're in for a treat with this game. So what is Bloodlines? Well Bloodlines is kind of a sports fighting platforming hybrid. If you ever imagine how the game tag could become a sport in some sort of dystopian future, well thanks to Bloodlines you can wonder no more. So the story here is that in the near future, all distinct cultures and individualities have been banned and outlawed by the government. So punks and rebels of different cultures bound together to preserve their unique identities by creating some sort of tribal combat tournament set across the globe. Look, I don't know how they managed to organise this whole thing with a supposed dystopian government breeding down their back, but fair play to them. You convert that old rig into a parkour playground, ain't nobody gonna stop you. Right, so clearly this isn't a game anchored by its story. Bloodlines is all about gameplay. And what you're looking at here? Well, let me try to break down what's happening. Gameplay takes place across a number of different arenas. Each of these arenas has a number of gates that a player needs to activate to win. The number remaining of these are highlighted on the HUD for each player. Sounds simple enough. The catch is that only one player at a time can activate these gates. So at the beginning of each round, you and your opponent both start off as neutral, and the first player to reach one of these gates becomes tagged, so to speak. The player that's tagged can activate the arena gates, and it's up to the opposing player to catch them so they can steal the tag from them, which will then allow them to activate gates. So what you have is a pretty chaotic game where players try to outsmart and platform around their opponents to either activate gates or block their opponent from doing the same, until somebody eventually reaches the round's quota. The idea of this game doesn't take very long to get used to. Matches tend to be quite short, and simply playing a couple of rounds is all you need to make things click. Of course, the game is a little more complicated than just tagging and platforming. While you could just simply out-platform your opponent, players will have plenty more tools at their disposal to help evade or lock down tricky foes. Every player is kitted out with a basic projectile attack that can fire out quick homing shots that slow down players briefly when hit. This can also be charged up to release a stronger shot that can knock down enemies, although your movement does slow while charging to compensate for the shot's strength. Items also randomly spawn at certain points on the map that let you activate powers like speed boost, shield, super jumps, homing hammers, and many other helpful abilities. Each of the game's 11 selectable characters also have their own unique power to help add some individuality to the gameplay. These abilities can be activated at any time when it matches as long as your power meter is filled up to at least 2 bars. These powers sometimes mirror the game's items like a super jump or speed boost, but some of them are completely unique, like the flying ability, the magnetic pulse that pulls enemies in if you're not tagged and pushes them away if you are. Some of the powers are also completely broken, like the character that can make you swap positions at will, and also the character that can shoot you with a homing rocket that reverses your controls briefly. Yeah, that one's uh, kind of bullshit. Now, I will say the characters with the OP powers are in fact boss characters. There's a total of four unlockable characters in this game earned through arcade mode, and they all tend to be the best in the game, so thankfully you won't have to deal with these much until the end of arcade mode, where they will make your life hell for a little bit. Seriously, a rocket that reverses my controls, what the hell radical? You know, this here is actually quite a fun and unique competitive title on the PlayStation. The core idea is quite simple, but it's a nice twist on arena combat, but really it all comes down to how good it feels to play. The controls are really smooth and gameplay is quick and fluid. Also keep in mind this is a PAL game, and for a PAL game to feel quick and fluid, that's impressive in itself. Platforming is simple, but it's a lot of fun, and the arenas themselves really set up some interesting platforming challenges that definitely keep you on your toes when you're trying to chase down or block off an enemy. Each of the levels also feature their own unique gimmicks like teleporters or low gravity, so there's enough variety to make each individual arena stand out from one another. I also quite like the visual style of the arenas too, their quasi-future tribal aesthetic actually reminds me a little of some of Unreal Tournament maps. Lots of modern elements combined with ancient locales, I dig it quite a lot. The various arenas really are the star of the show, they're well designed and graphically quite nice. The characters on the other hand, do not look so hot, and that's putting it nicely. This would normally be a big deal in other competitive character centric games, but the actual game is viewed from such a distance that you'll never really be able to make out the little details on your character anyway. They don't look very good close up, but the important thing is that you can easily make out your character from a distance. So if we have to take a hit visually on the character models to focus on keeping the gameplay smooth and playable from this distance, well then that's a compromise that I'm willing to make. As far as single player content goes, well you can play through the arcade mode across various different difficulties, with expert mode and the additional characters unlocking as you move your way on up. It's fun for what it is, but you can tell this game is really geared more towards multiplayer for its longevity. 
Of course, you've got the option of your standard 1v1 versus matches, but you can also set up tournaments using the in-game tournament option, and even better, you also have the option of playing with up to four players simultaneously, which is about as hectic and crazy as it sounds. I personally prefer the more concentrated chaos of 1v1 games, but I have no doubt if you got four people together who knew what they were doing, this would probably be a blast to play. Hell, Sony even used this game to market the PS1 multi-tap. You know, that thing nobody wanted to buy, but we had to buy it for Crash Team Racing. Yeah, we, we've all been there. Of course, Bloodlines isn't without its problems. While the camera view does give you a good overall view of the game arena, it can be quite difficult to judge the depth of certain platforms and objects thanks to the distance. So do expect to have a few platforming mishaps from time to time. Also, as mentioned earlier, the game's balance is a little bit lopsided, with certain characters' powers just eclipsing some of the others available. Also, the fact that you have to fight the two most annoying characters at the end of arcade mode with the difficulty bumped up as well, well, it's a struggle, let me tell you. Also, the single player longevity of this game is pretty low too. There's only so much you can play against the AI before you feel like you've seen it all before. The gameplay is fun, but it's just not as varied or dynamic as something like a fighting game to really keep you hanging around to dunk on the AI all day. Although, when it comes to multiplayer, I could see this being something you'd end up playing for hours. The games are short, they're action-packed, there's great potential to outsmart and outflank your opponents, and it all feels really good to play too. Plus, throw in some four players and tournaments for a party, and you're in for a good time with this one. Also, as always, we can't finish up without talking about the game's soundtrack, and thankfully, we got ourselves a doozy here. Bloodlines opts for a blend of tribal and drum and bass tunes, and what we have here is a fine example of peak 90s PS1 music. High energy, high tempo tracks that feature tons of cool little nods to the locales of each arena that they're based on. It's the perfect music to match the speed of the gameplay. Another soundtrack that is absolutely worth checking out if you can. I know Bloodlines won't be everybody's cup of tea, but I really enjoyed my time with this little competitive arena platformer. It's pretty lacking in single player content, but the core gameplay is still a ton of fun and really goes for something a little bit different. I think this is a no brainer if you're still playing your PS1 with your friends on the regular and are up for some competitive multiplayer fun, but for everybody else, I still think it might be worth seeking out this cool PAL obscurity, or at least give the soundtrack a spin online. Seriously, it's, it's very good. You are nothing. Easy. And with that, we've come to the end of Volume 4. We've got to check out an Aussie RTS with killer farm robots, an alien themed platformer that locked me out of going to church, and a unique character based uh, competitive sports platformer. But before we finish up, we need to slot each of the games into one of three categories. Is the game a must play? Is it something worth trying if you like the look of it? Or is the game trash and not worth your time? Although, I've given it some thought and having trash tier as the only bad tier is a little bit harsh in my opinion. So to balance things out, we're going to add the meh tier, which sits in between try and trash for games that I didn't personally enjoy playing, but still might be worth checking out with certain caveats. Volume 3 selection sees Bloodlines making it into try tier and the remaining two games debuting in the new meh tier. Bloodlines is a very good game, although it's definitely geared more towards multiplayer for longevity. If you're still playing your PS1 with your pals, I think this is a must get. It's still fun for solo players, but don't expect more than a few hours before the novelty of finding the AI wears off. KKND and Attack of the Saucer Man, well, I can't really say I enjoyed these games myself, but I wouldn't consider either of them trash or even outright bad. KKND's main issue is how it feels to play in 2021, it's just not something I could put up with nowadays, and this is coming from an ex-console RTS player. 
But then again, if you're really into PS1 RTSs and know what you're getting into, there's still a ton of well-made content here that keeps genre fans busy. Plus it gets bonus points for the inclusion of a split-screen mode. Although, if possible, I'd still recommend just trying the PC version instead, you'll probably have a much better time. Attack of the Saucer Man, well, it's just kind of mediocre. Although, the repetitive gameplay and game-breaking bugs aside, I did find there's still a lot of charm to the game's characters and writing. It also has some great music, and it is pretty content-packed for a game of this type. I could definitely see some people really enjoying this game, even though it ain't for me. You could certainly do a lot worse. So let me know, have you tried any of these games yourself? Are there any obscure games you'd like to see show up in the series? Drop me a comment below, and if there's any games that I missed on the list, I'll be sure to get them added. But as always, I'd like to say a big thank you for joining me today. If you enjoyed the video, a like and subscribe is always greatly appreciated. You can also check out previous volumes as well as plenty more PS1 content over on the channel. You'll find a link in the comments below. In the meantime, thanks again for joining me. I hope you're keeping happy, I hope you're keeping safe, and I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you all again next time, but until then, as always, praise the wheel.